defining a cluster is not easy. And, uh, but uh, the way we tell parents and providers uh, is that it's a seizure pattern that is different from the usual or expected pattern of seizures. Uh, most patients who have seizure clusters tend to have uh, difficult to control uh, or medically intractable epilepsy for the most part. There's another group of patients that we are not talking about and those are patients who may have long seizures um, and sometimes we use certain drugs that are similar in that situation. But the, the child and family uh, of, of someone with seizure clusters, they are clearly much more affected. Uh, their lives are more disrupted by having these seizure clusters, uh, especially if they occur un unpredictably uh, or in s situations outside of the home. It becomes much more disruptive, certainly, and uh, both the patient and family may be at risk for uh, isolating themselves or withdrawing um, in order to deal with that. Uh, and sometimes that cannot be healthy uh, for the long term. So having some way to deal with that, having an effective plan, is certainly very important. In dealing with seizure clusters, uh, it's important to communicate the fact that we need to have good control of seizures all the time. So there has to be a baseline therapy that is going on uh, that is appropriate and at adequate dosages for that child. The best way to lay out the plan of treatment is at the initial visit. When we talk about things such as seizure precautions, not climbing to high places, being careful around water, not taking a bath unattended, and so on. And we also talk about first aid measures, what to do in case of a long seizure, or what to do for a grand mal seizure. And the discussion of the seizure clusters uh, generally takes place at that time. Uh, the next time when it can uh, happen is at the follow-up visit after the initial tests come back with the MRI and EEG. Now we have a treatment plan and we talk about what is the daily medication your child may be taking, and then what is the rescue plan. Yeah. De developing a rescue plan is very important, but then also we have to have a plan for when, what constitutes an emergency, uh, a seizure longer than a certain number of minutes, or having so many seizures in a given amount of time. And so that discussion has to take place. And if uh, parents or caregivers are not prepared to give a rescue medication at home, then yes, we do talk about that it is okay to go to the emergency room, but to get there within, uh, usually within the first half hour, so that there's enough time for the emergency room staff to then get the patient's seizure under control. In developing a plan for dealing with seizure clusters, first of all, we talk about positioning of the patient, how to position so that they're not at risk of aspiration, for instance, or injury. Uh, the second aspect has to deal with keeping track of the time so we know when the seizure started. And so if the seizure goes longer than 10 minutes, a single seizure going longer than 10 minutes constitutes status epilepticus. So the definition of status epilepticus, which used to be 30 minutes or more, that has not changed. And so 10 minutes we regard as the likelihood that seizures are gonna stop on their own is very small. And that is an emergency. And so we are telling parents that at five minutes, get ready to call the ambulance. Um, and a rescue medication needs to be given perhaps as early as two or three minutes after the seizure has started. With regard to when does a seizure cluster evolve into status, that is harder to tell. But if a patient has a seizure, doesn't awaken and then goes into the next seizure. That also would be impending status epilepticus and should be treated emergently with rescue medication. So a lot of uh, young uh, adolescents who have seizures, they usually don't talk about it. They don't verbalize it very much. Uh, but instead what we see them happening is that they will withdraw and not go to very many events. Uh, and they may go to school, but they really don't step out beyond that. Um, and uh, so there is some of that, that fear and isolation, uh, embarrassment of having a seizure in public, 
keeping them in perspective, emphasizing normalcy, emphasizing or encouraging their participation in normal uh, childhood events uh, such as sports and prom and you know, dating, uh, being a part of that. One of the best ways that uh, patients uh, can make an effort to have a more normal lifestyle is to be open about what they have. But if the patient with epilepsy is encouraged to talk about the seizures and say, yes, I have seizures and uh, it's only for a minute or two and then I'm back. And also the fact that um, sometimes others are worried and fearful of what should I do when Maggie has a seizure. And so one of the things is that uh, which the, the patient with epilepsy can do or family members can do is to explain to their friends, if Maggie has a seizure, this is what you need to do. You know, turn her on her side, you know, just be with her, and if it's, you know, she should be able to recover in, in a few minutes and then she'll be okay. Or perhaps she needs to be watched until she is fully awake and alert. So knowing that uh, can be very helpful. Uh, and that allows then children to be more free with their friends. Most people in the community, they do want to help everybody and they want to be uh, of um, help and assistance to the patient who has epilepsy. But we have to encourage the patient to be more open about the condition.